Hello, everyone. Today we are talking about phenolics, and we're going to go about it using Legos, because chicken wire can be a little bit intimidating, but Legos make a lot more sense. So this presentation is designed for first year students at the Institute for Enology and Viticulture, but students in other study programs may find it valuable as well. But first, I want to give two big thank yous. The first is to Steve Price over here on the left. Uh, he is the phenolics expert for ETS Laboratories. And at a Master of Wine um, seminar, or I, it wasn't the seminar, but it was basically a, a, a private class, um, he did a really cool example talking about anthocyanins as Lego pirates. And Tim, in my mind, was totally blown. It made such great sense. So we decided to build out that world, pun intended. And uh, both Tim and myself came up with some cool new analogies utilizing the idea of Legos um, and what phenolic they correspond with. So I want to say thanks to both of them um, because I did not come up with this Lego idea alone for sure. So today we're going to talk about phenolics that come from the grape and we're just going to keep it simple. So it's going to be catechin, tannin, and anthocyanins. And then we're going to talk about uh, oak derived phenolics. Also just a one slide on orange wines. And then we're going to compare some varieties and see how the catechin, tannin, and anthocyanin in those varieties compare. So we're going to start out with catechin here, which is the building block of all things. So here is a copy and paste descriptor from ETS Laboratories. So catechin and epicatechin are known as flavanols, flavin 3 alls or procyanidins. We usually use the term flavin 3 alls and uh, they're present as monomers in grapes and wine. So what that means here, I'm just going to give this a little circle is it exists alone. So this guy's just loose floating around. And uh, uh, the difference between catechin and epicatechin is just the bond uh, direction over here on this hydroxyl group. So they're really effectively the same. And they're found in high concentrations in seeds and stems. And if grapes are less mature, they also may be found in the skins as well. And there can be a variety difference here. Like, for example, catechin tends to be really uh, low in the skins of Syrah, but significantly higher in the skins of Pinot Noir. And this is something that you've probably experienced on your palate if you've tasted those wines. Um, just Syrah just tends to be kind of fatter and more lush, and there tends to be kind of a bit more of astringency to Pinot Noir. So as grapes mature on the vine, the phenolics in the seed actually combine together to form this seed coat. And additionally, the seed also gets this waxy exterior. So this means that the phenolics there are less extractable um, as the grapes mature. So catechin and epicatechin are going to be lower in wines that are made from more um, mature grapes. So things that are harvested later because those things be just become less extractable. And these monomers bind together to form what we know as tannin. So um, this is actually a, a catechin gallate, but um, the, the idea basically is the same. We have these catechin-like tannins here that are binding together at this point right here. And then these chains can just go on for basically forever. So N could be really anything. So these little guys are binding up together to form these longer chains of tannin, which are less bitter. And now we're looking at tannin. So you can kind of see the visuals here. Now we're starting to put the blocks together and build a structure. And that structure is actually the palette structure of our wines. Uh, if we're talking about reds, I should say. So here's an overview on tannin from ETS again. So this includes phenolic polymers from grapes, seeds, skins, and stems. And this also includes compounds formed or modified in the wine. So what they mean by that is that um, 
we have all these different kind of small tannins that could be extracted from the skins or the seeds or the stems. And then they can also link up together to like oxidative reactions in the wine. So tannins are always evolving. And these polymers usually consist of linked proanthocyanidin units. So that's another way of saying those same catechins that we were just talking about. Um, and in this list here that ETS talks about, they say catechin, epicatechin, epigallocatechin, and epicatechin gallate. So really the difference there is um, bond direction on these um, hydroxyl units here and how many there are. Like in, you could have two or you could have three, but really um, they, they're acting pretty similarly. So after the crushing of the fruit um, and sort of the chaos of fermentation, these polymeric phenols can be modified through the additions of anthocyanins. So that means a color can get popped in there, other phenolic materials, and also even proteins, polysaccharides, and metal ions. So this image here looks really quite clean and simple, but it's actually not. Um, tannin overall is just a giant mess of stuff. Um, it's something that we wouldn't be able to draw out with like a chemical diagram. It's just going to be a ginormous mass of all sorts of different stuff. So, as I said, tannin can be complex. So what do we want to build in the structure of our wine? We could have smaller structures like this little miniature castle, or the tannins could be really, really huge. And as you can imagine, those things taste a little bit different. So eventually the tannins will get large enough where they fall out of solution and they precipitate. And you can see that um, in aged wines in bottle. But the structural uh, possibilities are close to endless. And anthocyanins, uh, going to Steve Price's thing, my girl, the Lego pirate. So here's an overview um, in a little bit more of a professional way from ETS. So anthocyanins are red pigments that are found in the grape skins. And they exist as monomeric glucosides. So really what that means is just that it's got a glucose attached to it here. And the primary anthocyanin pigment in most vitis vinifera grapes is malvidin glucoside. Um, but that's just kind of a fun little snacky fact. And um, it's found in greatest concentration in young wines. And as wines age, we get um, some interesting complex reactions that happen with anthocyanins. And um, that red form is most bright when these anthocyanins are monomeric, so they're just floating around alone. But the color is actually more stable if we stick this anthocyanin onto something. So we're going to talk about that in just a sec. And Viticulture is really important uh, for the concentration of all of these phenolic compounds that we're talking about, but um, anthocyanin is, is specifically light uh, incidence related. So we want some light exposure on our grapes. Um, so having um, leaf removal in the fruit zone at the right time or selecting clones that have sort of a looser cluster architecture can be helpful for increasing the color in our finished wines. And anthocyanin extraction from the grape and the stability of those color compounds are affected by winery production practices. So these monomeric anthocyanins are subject to hydrolysis, oxidation, and polymerization. So really what that means is they can be broken down, they can be stuck to something, um, and they can actually uh, get stuck to tannins in an interesting way, and we're just going to talk about that on our next slide. And these anthocyanin concentrations are highest, for, at least for monomers, um, early in fermentation. And then they decline during fermentation and aging because those anthocyanins get stuck to things. So the monomeric amount goes down, but actually the amount that um, is present um, doesn't drop off precipitously and it becomes this sort of polymeric form. So. Um, they actually, the monomeric anthocyanins, so those free floating ones, they decrease at a rate of about 50% a year. So that's a lot. And there's a reason that you see that color modification as wines age. And we see things go from maybe a more pure bright red 
more towards a bricking color and also just lower levels of pigmentation, less um, opacity in, in the wines. And pH can affect our anthocyanin expression. So at lower pH, um, the majority of the anthocyanins that are actually expressing color are in this flavium form, which is a red pigmented form. And then at higher pH, it goes into a quinodial form, which is sort of like a violet blue color. And that red pigment is still present. It's just that we have an increasing proportion of this other colored um, anthocyanin present. Um, so I like to do this little visual diagram here, sort of illustrating the, the color changes that we can see. And now we're going to talk about how anthocyanins that actually cap the end of a tannin. So you have these little green uh, bricks right here. These are our catechins. And we can stick another catechin on top of there or another small tannin, and we can keep building if we have that top part exposed. But if an anthocyanin comes along, when you have our little lady pirate go on top of there, this thing can't grow anymore. We can't put any more bricks on top and continue to grow this structure because the anthocyanin is there now. Um, so this whole structure could be known as a, a polymeric anthocyanin. Um, and it also just caps the structure from growing overall. And um, counter to my uh, little visual illustration here, this also helps in the smoothing of tannins, though this pirate has a sword so you know the analogy is breaking down a little bit <laughs> so here's our small tannin you know it's got a couple subunits here and then we put our anthocyanin pirate on the top and now we can refer to this whole unit as a polymeric anthocyanin um, and this is a pretty stable form of color it's easy for the individual anthocyanin to get lost um, but once it's attached to something, it's a much more stable form. Now we're moving into oak phenolics. So I'm kind of imagining oak phenolics like the other cool pieces that are in the Lego set. Um, you can't build anything with them on their own, but they integrate into the landscape and make it much more interesting and rich. And oak tannins are also called elagitannins. And this was a previously controversial topic. So if you've heard me talk a little bit about oak tannins before, I always have sort of a questioning tone in my voice because um, I've heard phenolic chemists say, well, you know, these kind of things just don't really exist. You know, we can't find them. And, um, and that's because these types of phenolics tend to disappear in the wine. Like they evade the usual detection methods like high performance liquid chromatography. But now we've started to see them pop up and become trackable with some new technologies. So let's take a look here at this uh, phenolic compound here. I'm just going to get my little pen. So here we have a grape derived section here. This is a catechin, so like the green Lego. And then this guy right here, elagic acid, came out of the barrel. So uh, it's really cool to see that now we actually do have these more complex structures. So um, one of the upsides here of these phenolic compounds is kind of putting my eyeballs on this. Uh, I'm not an expert, but what I would say here is that because we've got the catechin bound up here, it's probably having a less bitter presentation in the wine. So um, I can understand that thinking about how um, barrels actually do help to smooth out the phenolic profile of a wine. Um, so I would imagine that this might have a, a more mild taste compared to just a straight up catechin. So elagitannins can vary with oak sources. So different oak sources just really vary in the, le the level of tannin that's in the wood and then the tannin that they can contribute to the wine. So ranging from high to low, we have European pedunculate oak, which is Quercus robur. We have European sessile oak, which is Quercus betraea, and then finally American white oak, which is Quercus alba. But also to make things a little bit more complicated, different toasting levels can vary the tannin contribution. So a heavier toast means 
more tannin degradation and lower tannin in the finished wine. So um, Cooper can be really important here and it might even have more uh, of an impact than actual original oak sources. And we're gonna talk more about that in your second year when we compare um, our oaks, uh, thanks to ETS Laboratories for doing the analysis. So for fun here, let's just show the map. So this is pedunculate oak here, um, and then compare that to sessile oak. So um, this kind of oak is a little bit more drought tolerant, and you can sort of see that here because we're starting to get uh, stuff grown further south um, and in um, higher heat and higher light areas. And now for something completely different. What about orange wines? And what about rosé wines, actually, for that matter? Um, orange wine has become an increasingly hot topic. So these are wines that are made from white grapes that undergo some sort of skin contact. And in that case, we do actually have tannins that come out of the skins. But because the white grapes don't have anthocyanins, we're not going to get any pirates. And because there is less tannin in white grape skins than there are red grape skins, we're not going to have a huge structure. So think about it as sort of the small castle as opposed to the big Harry Potter Hogwarts castle. Um, something to mention here also, in rosé wines, um, the maceration is usually shorter than um, what we would have in an orange wine. So we actually have pretty low tannin we do have a sort of a lick of astringency in those wines, but we do have anthocyanins present. So um, both of those styles of wine can have light levels of tannin um, and yes, anthocyanins in rosé, uh, no anthocyanins in orange wines. That sort of orangey color actually comes from tannin, believe it or not. And um, this is something that you've probably experienced if you've drank some um, aged white wines, you see that they actually take on a more golden hue. And that isn't from something that came from the grape skins um, that are color coming from the grape skins. That's a, a tannin interaction there. So now for some fun, uh, let's take a look at uh, some actual examples comparing different varieties. So the data from this comes from um, our global database where we've analyzed, um, or I should say ETS, thank you, has analyzed um, 200 finished wines. So looking at tannin here, so this is the structure, comparing Cab Merlot, Syrah, Pinot, and Grenache. So these are the average values for wines of this variety from this database. And um, you're not getting something that you probably haven't experienced in your real life here. Like, take a look. Cab is the highest. Merlot is a little lower, but Merlot can still have a lot of tannin. And Syrah is nearly the same as Merlot. Pinot Noir has way less structure. Um, and Grenache um, is significantly lower than those other varieties as well, but still has more than Pinot. And now looking at Catechin. So these are our small, more bitter seed tannins. These are the building blocks of larger tannin structures. And um, I love taking a look at that Syrah versus Pinot. This is super telling. So Pinot Noir, just as a variety, naturally has more catechin. And then if we're growing Pinot in even cooler, uh, more marginal climates, we're gonna have even more catechin just because we're gonna have potentially less ripe seeds. And now total anthocyanins, um, our Lego pirates here. So you already know this, Syrah tends to be the most deeply pigmented variety and Cab and Merlot are dark, but they're not as dark as Syrah. And Pinot is definitely way less colorful. And Grenache again is known for its very light color. Um, still has a little bit more than those Pinots, but it's quite a bit different from the Cab Merlot and Syrah. Thank you all for tuning in. If you've got any questions, shoot me a note. Digby is off to enjoy this uh, turly zin right there. Um, I don't have very much zin info in my database, so that's maybe something that I need to get on. Thank you so much.